Truth Unveiled here, and today I have some groundbreaking information to share with you. We're going to be talking more about the real scriptural Jerusalem location and following up on our documentary that we did on the scriptural Jerusalem, along with talking about some real groundbreaking information when it comes to the location of the real Jerusalem temple and where it could have been located and where it is today. We're also going to be exposing the lies of the third temple ritual and the lies of the third temple period and the lies of the fake Jerusalem. And we're going to be looking at scripture once again and exposing the lies and exposing the liars so that you can see the truth and so that the truth will make you free. Now, if you have not already seen the documentary that was made back in October of this year, then please do so in the description box below so that you can get a better idea and understanding of what we're going to be talking about because later on in the video, we're going to be covering some books about the real scriptural ancient archaeological temple of Jerusalem and where it's actually located. Now, since the documentary's release about two months ago, of course, there's been nothing but attacks on this subject. And of course, there's been many multiple videos coming out trying to debunk and debate this subject. Now, again, I understand this. I understand that it has been years worth of deceptions. I understand that it's been years worth of lies, thousands of years worth of inherited lies from the Gentiles. I understand that and I get that completely. I also understand that this is something that requires years worth of research. And for those who are still on the fence or who are still disagreeing, once again, when it comes to this network and this channel, I do not want you to agree with the word I say. In fact, I'd rather you not agree, but rather I'd rather you do the research on your own and come to your own conclusions and see what is truth, compare it to the word, which is the truth, and then see what the truth really is. And like I always say on this network, don't believe a word I say. In fact, don't believe a word that anybody is telling you until you yourself have done the research, have looked into these things to really find out for yourself, because that is where you're going to find the truth when you do the research on your own. And that is why the comments are turned off for this video, because the reality is you can agree or you can disagree when it comes to this or any other topic on this network, even when it comes to the 2019 topic. However, what will not be allowed and what will not be tolerated on this network is disrespect or any type of disrespect whatsoever. But moving forward, well, what does scripture tell us? Scripture even says that the real Jerusalem would be what? It would be a den of jackals and that it would be desolate without inhabitant. What is it saying? Yaramaya u Jeremiah 9, 11 through 12. And I will make Yarushalum or Jerusalem heaps, a den of jackals. And I will make the cities of Yahuda or Judah desolate without inhabitant. Who is the discerned man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth the Yahuwah has spoken that he may declare it for what the land perisheth and is burned up like a wilderness that none passeth through. All throughout scripture, we are told that the real Jerusalem would be without inhabitant, that it would be a place of jackals and that there would be nobody there according to the prophecies until the real scriptural people return to our homeland. When you know who the real people of scripture are, that has not happened yet because the 1948 return was a fraudulent return. And so now, well, based on scripture, well, according to this, the Jerusalem population that they tell you today is 857,752 as of the year 2015. And they tell you that the population of the fake Israel is 8.38 million as of the year 2015 but according to the prophecies that we just read in scripture alone and like i said you can take a look at the video for more to get those scriptural references according to that the population of the real jerusalem is zero because according to scripture, this fake one, well, it does not look uninhabited to me. I don't see any ruins over here. People are passing through and there are no jackals anywhere in this region or in this area in the fake Jerusalem. So somebody is lying then.
However, like we've gone over in the documentary, the Kalahari Desert containing the real Jerusalem and what we're about to share with you today, you will also see that there have been ancient ruins found of what? Of the ancient temple of Jerusalem found in this region too that I'm about to share with you in a region where there are no inhabitants. What about the scriptural Babylon, though? What about that? Because surely the one that they tell us, that surely has to be the scriptural Babylon, right? Well, according to his word, according to Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 37, it says this, And Babal shall become a heap, a habitation of jackals, an astonishment and a hissing, without inhabitant, meaning that it is without inhabitant, meaning that the population of the real scriptural Babylon today is also zero. However, what they tell us here, though, that Babylon in so-called Iraq has a population of 1.73 million as of 2015. How can that be when the scriptural one is a population of zero? And we've already covered a video on ancient Babylon showing you where the real ancient Babylon is. And if you would like to learn more about that, please take a look at our playlist that's linked in the description box below. But then there's the topic of borders too, because Brashith Genesis chapter 15 verse 18 talks about how what? That the borders were given to Abram from the river of Egypt or the valley of Egypt all the way until the Euphrates River, and that would be the land, that would be the inheritance of Abraham, or Abraham, right? So, oh, that's so simple then. So we just do the river of Egypt right here, all the way up until the Euphrates River over here, and this is the borders, right? But where's the real true Euphrates River? Because according to the National Geographic magazine, volume 32, that was published 100 years ago by the National Geographic Society as of 1918, 30 years before the fraudulent nation was formed, this will tell you more about the Euphrates River because we need to get some context on this. And we also have to understand that names have been changed, things have been tampered with, maps have been burned. All of this stuff has happened during colonization in order to promote his story and also promote the false borders. Because if you take a look at this book on page 395, where the National Geographic Magazine, volume 32, page 395, that says, quote, in this kingdom, there enters a branch of the river Euphrates, Niger, the friar does not confuse this with the Mesopotamian Euphrates, but assumes two rivers with the same name. This river forms three branches, one entering the middle of one of the kingdoms and the other branches flowing round the whole kingdom, the width in some places being two days journey. When I crossed this great river, I made a long journey along its banks, which are very populous, referring evidently to the river Benu, a tributary of the Niger. So this source tells you that there are two Euphrates rivers. The question is, which one is the scriptural one? And like we've gone over in the documentary, this map from 1742 shows you the Euphrates River right here in Ghana, right above Judah near the Niger River when Judah migrated northward up in this region during this time. So you see the Euphrates River is shown right here. We have two witnesses to confirm this, the National Geographic Society along with the map from 1742, a map that is well over 250 years old. Oh, but that's right. We cannot trust these sources, can we? Because they're from our enemies, right? We can't trust these sources because they've been pinned by our enemies and colonizers and oppressors, right? But yet we can trust them when they tell us their maps of the 1948 fraudulent fake Israel. Yet we can trust them when they tell us their fake false borders of the river Euphrates being in Iraq, so-called, when it is in fact not. Yet we can trust our enemies when it comes to those types of sources, right? Sounds like hypocrisy to me. Especially when our creator even tells us to what? Seek and search the ancient path, as in search the ancient things, search ancient texts that includes ancient maps that come all the way from the 1700s, if not earlier. 
So then this is a major game changer because if we know here then that what the real Euphrates River is in this region near Ghana so called near the Niger River the Volta River a tributary of the Niger if we know that then what we just looked at from the National Geographic Society along with what the river of Egypt and by the way the so-called river of Egypt extends all the way into Uganda, all the way into this region. So between that, we get what? All of this region over here, all of so-called Southern Africa over here, because also Zephaniah or Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 10 says, beyond the rivers of Cush. Well, Cush is somewhere up here. So beyond there, we'd have to go more southward. And again, like we've talked about before, when it comes to the whole Egypt debate too, when it comes to, oh, well, how could the Messiah and Miriam or Mary, the mom of the Messiah, Yahusha, how could they have walked all the way from so-called South Africa and go down to Egypt? Well, once again, once upon a time, those borders were not like that. How do you know that the borders of Egypt today were the scriptural Egyptian borders, especially when there's been archaeological evidence of Egyptian figures that have been found as South as Zimbabwe that even borders so-called South Africa. Again, we have to continuously do our research and not believe a word that has been told to us or has been spoon-fed to us. And yes, this is a new concept to a lot of us. However, that is what his word says to what seek and you shall find. It doesn't just stop at knowing who the true people are, but what about the true land? Again, how do any of us know anything when it pertains to ancient maps, when all of the original maps have been burned, everything has been flipped upside down, literally, and now the purpose of this network is to restore the truth, and again, to find and seek and search the truth, years worth of research. Now, we've gone over this before when it comes to the Garden of Eden being depicted at the southernmost tip of Africa with the symbol of two concentric rings from which emerge the four rivers of Eden that that are mentioned in Brashith or Genesis chapter 2 and note how one of them appears to be the Nile that's right there and this is from a 1411 map that comes from Diverga and like I said you can learn more about that in the documentary this map is what well over 600 years old and what we've also gone over from our Assyria video is what? Canaan, land, the land of Canaan, the real true land of Canaan. They're even telling you what it is and where it is because they tell you right here, Canaan, land, local municipality. Where is it? They tell you that it's where within the Western Cape in so-called South Africa right there. You see the seal right there, which is the Aleph right here in the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. Near the Eden District, you mean the Garden of Eden District along the Garden Root District right here that is also in so-called South Africa? This is a map from 1893 that was also featured in the documentary. And as you can see right here in so-called South Africa along the Cape region, you will see Mamre is listed right there, the Oaks of Mamre, along with Canna land right there, which is the land of Canaan. And also Brashid, Genesis chapter 49, verse 30, which even tells us the cave that is the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, Mamre, Canaan, Mamre, Canaan, Mamre, the land of Canaan. And how do we know that Canaan land is actually referring to the land of Canaan? Well, we know right here in the Dictionary of Southern African Place Names, page 108, and this was done by the Human Science Research Council, because what do they do? What, Like the saying goes, where is the best place to put the truth? In a book. Because if you look right here, Canaan, it will tell you where the name is derived from. It will give you the etymology. And it also says here that it's also encountered as Canaan with the K that we just saw on the map. And what? And K Canaan's land too? They even subliminally tell you about the 12 Apostles Mountain Range in Table Mountain in Cape Town. And we've also gone over in the documentary when it comes to Gibeon and the truth about that in so-called Namibia, along with many other multiple places and regions.
But again, it's not my job to convince you. It is only for me to get out this truth no matter what. That is what I am purposed to do here, and that is what this network and channel is purposed to do, and that is what we're going to continue to do. However, what will not be allowed is blatant disrespect. Moving forward, now we're going to talk more about that actual temple location and its remains and ruins. And what you're going to see is some real cool sources and documents that talk more about that. Because we're here also from the documentary that says what in Lamentations chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 about how Jerusalem mourns and how she sits alone. Now we're here at the Africa Geographic and the reason why we're here is because it talks more about the Kalahari's Kigaligati Transfrontier Park and we're going to be looking at this park right here and there's a reason for it because it also talks about how it is a barren wilderness sounds like what that little to no inhabitants are actually there and it even says that at over 3.5 million hectares this arid and ancient stretch of land Land crossing the border between so-called South Africa and Botswana is double the size of Kruger and almost the same size as the Netherlands. This is a very important region and your government knows this. Your governments, they all know how important this region is. Why? Because I'm about to share with you some real important stuff in just a moment to come. But here we are at Wikipedia that talks more about it. It says Kigala Gadi Transfrontier Park. The reason I'm here is because I wanted to show you a map of this region. Now, for those of you who have already seen the documentary, when it comes to the Jerusalem maps and where Jerusalem is located on the map, you'll see that it's very close by near this region along Botswana and so-called South Africa along the border of Namibia right here. Now it's actually located within the Kalahari Desert itself. Now please keep this region in mind and keep this area in mind in this region in Botswana, so-called South Africa, and Namibia because we're going to be talking more about this region and why it's so significant. By the way, this is a map of the distribution of the black-backed jackal, and as you'll see, where is it located? In the real Jerusalem region, all throughout the Kalahari Desert area, in Namibia, Botswana, and so-called South Africa. Now, in the documentary, we showed you 16 maps of Jerusalem, pinpointing Jerusalem in so-called South Africa. Now, once again, this video makes way more sense if you actually take a look at the two-hour documentary, if you already have not. But for those who already have, well, as you can see from the documentary, this map comes from 1886 that shows Jerusalem along the Orange River. Now, the Orange River is the boundary point between Namibia and so-called South Africa that divides the two and right here is Beersheba the real scriptural Beersheba that is still a town in Namibia along with the scriptural Bethany that's not too far now we're not going to go over all 16 maps because we've already done that but we will take a look at a few of them and you'll see that what Jerusalem is going to be in the same location there have been claims that oh the map show Jerusalem in a different location no it's in the same location in southeastern Namibia now again like we've talked about in the documentary the earliest map of Jerusalem seen right here was shown in 1854 with the latest shown in 1912 now again there could have been even earlier maps of Jerusalem shown in this region but they have maybe been hidden they've maybe been burned anything could have happened because what the colonizers have been in this region for how many hundreds of years plenty of time to burn the original maps genocide the people there that knew the truth about this region make it so that everything has been hidden steal the artifacts bring those artifacts to a fake region known as the middle east so called and then get the world to believe a lie because the enemy what satan deceives the entire world and then give you the fraudulent fake 1948 Israel the same year that apartheid began where in so-called South Africa which is near this Jerusalem huh not a coincidence but this map is very important because what it comes from 1886 please keep this year in mind 1886 because this is a very important year and you're gonna find out why when it comes to the real Jerusalem temple 
And remember this, there's a reason for everything. There's a reason you're watching this video right now, and there is a reason that Google Maps will not show Jerusalem in so-called Namibia, because you have to go here for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency to be able to find out, and we've talked about this and pinpointed this in our documentary about the real Jerusalem location in so-called Namibia within the Kalahari Desert. And again, just because it's a dot right here, well, once upon a time, Jerusalem could have been a much larger region. But again, this gives us an idea of where it potentially is. Now, as you can see right here, we're in so-called Namibia, and here is so-called South Africa down here. If we zoom in, you'll see that the nearest town closest to Jerusalem is this one right here, Ariams Valai, right there. You'll see that the Jerusalem pinpointed is in an area where there is what? No inhabitant. Nobody's there. You see that the land is barren. The land is desolate, just like scripture says. Sounds like a scriptural match to me. Way more of a match than that fake one that they show you that's populated with tons of people. But anyway, if you go here to the Kagalagadi Transfrontier Park, you'll see that it's not too far away. So if you go a little bit more up here, you'll see that that national park is right there. So it's not that far from where Jerusalem is located and pinned pointed on all 16 maps. But for the purposes of this video so that we can get another witness, I will show you another map of Jerusalem. Now again, you can take a look at all of these maps. You can take a look at them in the documentary. I'll also leave them in the description box below so you can take a look at all 16 maps that will show you Jerusalem, that will show it being located in southeastern Namibia as it's commonly known today. Now you also see Gibeon that's located up here from a map from George Bacon from 1900. And here's Beersheba and there's Bethany right there and then there's Jerusalem near Warmbad which is towards the southern region of Namibia and right there that black line is the Orange River once again so once again all within the same region all within close proximity the same area and why is it that multiple cartographers list Jerusalem within the same region? Why is this the case? Because here is another map from 1858. You see the Orange River right there, all within close proximity. There's that town Bethany again that we talked about. And then they even show Pella. Could this be the scriptural Pella that's located today in so-called South Africa? So again, taking a look at this, you'll see here is Jerusalem right here in so-called Namibia, and then you have the National Park over here that's not too far. Once again, please keep these two locations in mind because they're going to be key in helping us find and helping us figure out the real scriptural ruins of the real Jerusalem temple. Now, we're not going to go over all these sources, but I will link them in the description box below so that you can see what this is talking about if you have not heard of this before, but it's called the Lost City of the Kalahari. Well, it's not lost anymore. And what am I talking about? Well, you're about to see, because it says, for more than a century in Western circles, rumors have abounded as to the existence of a massive city covered by the sands of the Kalahari. The Kalahari has a total extent of about 850,000 square kilometers or 350,000 square miles, most of it falling within Botswana. The word Kalahari is said to come from a local word meaning dry, waterless place. That is a desert or what? Deserted place. The rumors are started in the late 1800s from a man by the name of Jalarmi Farini who visited the Kalahari in 1895 to look for diamonds. He went off in early winter from Cape Town with his son Lulu and an entourage and returned six months later claiming to have found a lost city of the Kalahari, one of the many that have been found in Bushmen legends. The Bushmen or the San people apparently claim that there are many cities in the Kalahari area that were never inhabited because of a terrible drought. The cities were in the process of being built when abandoned. 
And what I'm about to do in a moment to come is I'm about to share with you some of Farini's findings. I'm about to share with you some of the findings of the expedition that they went on. And again, this is based on people who have actually been in these regions. This is based on eyewitness accounts. This is based on witnesses. This is based on people who have been in these regions, been to these lands, and been to these areas. Not people who have never been there before. So until you have been to these regions and have visited these places yourself, it's best not to speak about it. But then it goes on to say right here, Farini's son sketched and photographed the remains of the city and Farini published a book through the Kalahari Desert and we're going to be taking a look at this book on his return to London. And by the way, the expeditions were made all throughout the 1880s and, and the 1890s. So then when he returned to London, he also addressed the Royal Geographical Society and the Berlin Geographical Society and even staged a lost city exhibition. Now, Farini described the city as one of colossal proportions made from massive stones stacked on top of each other. The city was laid out in an arc and resembled the Great Wall of China after an earthquake. Part of the city was exposed and part hidden under the sand. Digging away some of the sand exposed the pavement six meters wide with the longer stones laid at right angles to the path. Intersecting the pavement at right angles was another pavement making a type of cross. There were no inscriptions or markings to be found anywhere and Farini estimated the ruins to be what? thousands of years old he was inspired to write a poem about it so this is the picture with the cross right there and this is another picture of their findings and what they found and again this was found where in the kalahari what did they really find because when i show you his poem well that's going to tell you what they found now there have also been plenty of other expeditions within the same region that have also documented some of their findings and we're going to be going over some of the research that was done even in the 1970s by another expeditioner because according to this source it says since Farini there have been about 30 expeditions to find the lost city but none have been successful of most interest is one mounted in 1964 by professor A.J. Clement the his 77 year old dad a journalist and a photographer at the town of Rietfontein they were shown an extremely unusual rock formation known as the eggshell hills and then it gives some quotes right here and now what I really just wanted to show you was the pictures of these rocks in different places that you'll see of course they're going to claim that there are hundreds of millions of years old because again that's part of the lie but you can see the rocks right there stacked together you can see them right here again right there Clement claims that this is just a natural rock formation and not a lost city but like I said we're going to take a look at the evidence and I'm going to show you other researchers and what they have to say about this region people who have actually been to these regions so you can actually take a look but again here is the rock right there this is how the rocks look in this region now where is this area Rietfontein where is that Remember we told you to keep Jerusalem in this map in mind because here if we zoom out you'll see the areas nearby there's Botswana, so called South Africa and Namibia are three main countries that we're going to be taking a look at today and focusing on. When we zoom in here is Jerusalem Namibia that's shown on the ancient maps. Oh look and not too far is what? Riet Fontaine right there in so called South Africa near this trans frontier park near the national park that once again is not that far from the scriptural Jerusalem they're right in close proximity now again there are plenty other sources that we're going to take a look at I'm not going to go over all of them but this is another one from Wikipedia that talks more about the lost city of the Kalahari and actually the expedition was made in 1885 now Farini was known by multiple names it was the pseudonym of William Leonard Hunt who has been said to be one of the first Westerners to cross the unexplored portion of the Kalahari and of course they're going to give us his story's version they're going to tell us about the colonizers and our enemies and oppressors who've been in these regions first. 
But they'll never tell you about the region 2,000 years ago because they know the truth about it. That's why they've tried to hide it and cover it up. Not anymore. Now, this gives more information about William Leonard Hunt, if it's even a he, because we know that your elite Illuminati are what transgenders, but that's for another topic in another video that we've covered before. But as you can see right here, that what Hunt was known by the stage name, the great Farini, and these are the other pen names that Farini has gone by, as you can see right here. There was also a PBS article done about this that talks about history as propaganda in so-called South Africa in Zimbabwe, lost cities of the South. Again, all of the sources we're going to link in the description box below when it comes to the so-called lost city, because now we're going to actually take a look at the so-called lost city and see what it really is. Now, this is the actual book that says, Through the Kalahari Desert, a narrative of a journey with gun, camera and notebook to Lake Ngami and back and it's by Farini. Now note, when was it published? It was published in 1886. Now it's interesting how this is part of the collection of the Smithsonian. The digitizing sponsor is Smithsonian Libraries and the contributor is the Smithsonian Libraries. Huh, why is the Smithsonian so interested in this book? Why would they need to get their hands or should I say claws on this book? Remember that map we showed you from cartographer G.W. Colton that was published in what year? 1886 that shows the map of Jerusalem and Beersheba and Bethany. Remember that? Remember we told you to keep that year in mind? Huh, is that a surprise or a coincidence that within the same year, within the same region of the Kalahari, which is this region, that all of this would be published? That's not looking like a surprise or a coincidence. But now we're going to go inside of the book so you can see exactly what it says and so that you can see some of the remains in the ruins that was founded by Farini and by multiple witnesses and see exactly what it is a match of. Now, the book itself is 475 pages long. Of course, we're not going to go over all of that. However, what we are going to do is take a look at some of the ruins that was founded. Because if you go to page 356, this is what you're going to find, starting towards the paragraph at the very bottom. It says, going further south, the trees became more and more scanty. On the second day, we sighted a high mountain, which Jan thought was the Kiki Mountain on the Nasab River, but we were not far enough south for that and on reaching the foot of it we turn out to be one that nobody seemed to have ever seen or heard of so they're near the Nasab River so what we're doing is we're taking an expedition we're taking an expedition as if we are there also because that's the best way to understand this in the geographical sense of all this now remember it just said that they were near the Nasab River so if you look that up Nasab River Botswana you'll see that it's around this region right here at this park in this area remember the town Rietfontein that was also described and we'll talk more about that in that region in a moment but again it's all in close proximity and remember we told you that Jerusalem is in this area pinpointed on maps so again all within the same region within the Kalahari Desert but moving on the book says on page 357 we camped near the foot of it beside a long line of stone which looked like the Chinese wall after an earthquake and which on examination proved to be the ruins of quite extensive structure in some places buried beneath the sand but in others fully exposed to view we traced the remains for nearly a mile mostly a heap of huge stones but all flat-sided and here and there with the cement perfect and plainly visible between the layers the top row of stones were worn away by the weather and the drifting sands some of the uppermost ones curiously rubbed on the underside and standing out like a center table on one short leg the general outline of this wall was in the form of an arc inside which lay at intervals of about 40 feet apart a series of heaps of masonry in the shape of an oval or an obtuse ellipse about a foot and a half deep and with a flat bottom but hollowed out at the sides for about a foot from the edge 
Some of these heaps were cut out of solid rock, others were formed of more than one piece of stone fitted together very accurately. As they were all more or less buried beneath the sand, we made the men help to uncover the largest of them with the shovels, a kind of work they did not much like, and found that where the sand had protected the joints, they were quite perfect. This took nearly all one day, greatly to Jan's disgust, so we see, but as we keep going, he could not understand wasting time uncovering old stones. To him, it was labor thrown away. But doesn't the scripture say that what? The rocks cry out? Could this be why? Notice this part. I told him that here must have been either a city or a place of worship or the burial ground of a great nation perhaps thousands of years ago. Let me ask you this. What nation do you think this is talking about? Oh, but let's keep going because now we're on page 358 where it talks about an ancient ruin. And what does it say? Yeah, huh, very interesting and suspicious indeed. But then it goes on to talk about how they dug it up and didn't want to dig it up. But then it goes on to say, so the next day we had it all to ourselves and the discoveries we made amply repaid us for our labors. On digging down nearly in the middle of the ark, we came upon a pavement about 20 feet wide made of large stones. The outer stones were long ones and lay at right angles to the inner ones. This pavement was intersected by another one, similar one at the right angles, forming a Maltese cross. So that's the picture right here, the ruins on the Kalahari Desert. So this is the cross that they're talking about that it formed, in the center of which at one time must have stood what? In the center must have stood an altar column or some sort of monument did you see that altar for the base was quite distinct composed of loose pieces of fluted masonry having searched for hieroglyphics or inscriptions and finding none lulu took several photographs and sketches from which i must leave others more learned on the subject than i to judge as to when and by whom this place was occupied for myself, I have ventured to sum up my conclusions on the subject in the following verses, and this is a poem that Farini wrote, and I'm going to zoom in so you can see it yourself. So now we're on page 359, an ancient ruin of that same book that comes from 1886. And it says right here, this is the poem that was given. A half buried ruin, a huge wreck of stones on a lone and desolate spot. That sounds very scriptural to the scriptural Jerusalem that's where? Desolate. Then it says what? A temple or a tomb for human bones left by man to decay and rot rude sculptured blocks from the red sand project and shapeless uncouth stones appear some great man's ashes designed to protect buried many a thousand year a relic may be of a glorious past a city once grand and sublime huh wasn't jerusalem once grand destroyed by earthquake defaced by the blast swept away by the hand of time it was not till three days after leaving the ruins, traveling all the way over a gentle slope, that we came to the Kiki Mountain. Then they talk about some more things that they found in the region, how they traveled to a marsh that was nearby and found some insects and things like that, and they give more of their findings in the book. Now, if you keep going to page 361, this will actually tell you and give you a more close proximity of the region that they were on their way back to Mir right there. So we have another pinpointed region and location to let us know where they were nearby, the region that they were in on their journey and on their expedition. So remember, we told you to keep this river in mind, the Nassab River that's in Botswana right here. And actually, it is a river that not only is in Botswana, but it also helps divide Botswana and South Africa. It's one of the dividing points of this region. Now, if you zoom in a little bit more, remember that town Mir that's nearby? So again, it's all within this region, Rietfontein. And what was found in this region? This is the same region that what? That shows you what? Gibeon, that's nearby that's not too far Rehoboth is a scriptural town too right here as you see right there as we've talked about before Beersheba's right here Bethany is right there 
You see the real scriptural Gibeon that's not too far, that's barely five hours away. So there's Gibeon right there. And we showed you how many other scriptural regions in our documentary, places such as Jericho, places such as Hebron, places such as the Jordan, and many other scriptural regions, even places like Daniel's Den that's located not too far from here either. So it just so happens that all of these scriptural regions are nearby, not to mention the Jerusalem over here. And so what did they find in this region? Well, it tells you here once again from the book on page 357 that what? A city, place of worship, burial ground of a great nation thousands of years ago. What does that sound like? And then the maps of Jerusalem, not one, not two, not three, not four, but 16 maps of Jerusalem within the same location, within the same region that shows Jerusalem within the same proximity of the same area with other scriptural regions nearby. And not to mention from the poem that we just read, it even says what? A temple bull right there. You even see that along with what? Stood an altar on page 359 based on eyewitness accounts and multiple witnesses. Not based on my opinions, not based on what I think, not based on the lies of my enemies, but based on actual facts. The fact of the matter is this, that the real scriptural Jerusalem has not only been found, but so has the actual Jerusalem temple with actual documented archaeological evidence, geographical evidence, scriptural evidence, academic evidence, all right here. It has now been found. This city is no longer a lost city. Because this is letting you know that the ancient temple stood here. Yes, the real Jerusalem temple. Yes, the real Jerusalem Hayakal or temple that was conducted in scriptural times. That one that we read about in scripture, it was right here in this region. Not that fake one that they show you in Jerusalem today. Not in that fake Jerusalem. Not in that fake Israel. And this is not based on my feelings. This is based on actual truth. Because remember this, the truth will make you free. And now is the time to expose the lies. Now is the time to expose the liars and anyone else promoting them. Oh, but we're just getting started. We're not done because now we're going to explore some other people who have been to this region and traveled to this region too. And we're going to get their eyewitness accounts also so that we can get multiple witnesses because what by the mouth of two or more witnesses can every matter be established. So, well, let's get some more witnesses and let's get some more eyewitness accounts of people who have actually been to this region. And let's see what they have to say about this region of people who've actually been here. So until you have actually been to these regions and traveled to these regions and uncovered the evidence and the archaeological facts yourself, until you have traveled to Namibia, until you have traveled to Botswana, until you have traveled to so-called South Africa to excavate these regions, well, then you can make a rebuttal video. And then you can disagree. But anyway, moving forward, this comes from Lost Cities and Ancient Mysteries of Africa and Arabia by David Hatcher Childress right here. And we're on page 393 of this book. And there is a reason why we're here. It was published in 1989. Now it says right here what they call Hottentots, relatives of the Bushmen or the San people, but living a more settled lifestyle, told a Dr. W. M. Borchardt about a lost city along the course of a dry tributary which joined the Nassab River, that's the river we just looked at between Botswana and so-called South Africa, somewhere between Kwangpan and Roy Kopp, the lost city. Anytime it says lost city, by the way, it's talking about Jerusalem, whether or not the expeditioners, whether or not they actually know that, but that's what it's talking about. Notice how it says Atlantis and the Kalahari. Why does it say that? So to give you a better visual, once again, this is the Nassab River that's right here in Botswana that runs along Botswana right there. And then here's Roykop, so-called South Africa over here. Now, again, the river goes this way, going towards this direction, running along this way, north and south. So if we, we zoom out, you'll see that it's all along this transfrontier park that's right near the Jerusalem that was spoken of, right near the exact same area, right near the exact 
same region in this same region and this same area. Now remember the book just told us from page 393 that what? It's between Roykop, the lost city so-called, aka what? The remains of Jerusalem. And we told you that Jerusalem is much bigger than that dot on the map. But what? Roykop and Kwangpan, you'll see that if you take a look at a map right here, you'll see that they're not too far from each other. They're along that same river, the Nassab River, that divides Botswana and South Africa, so-called, as you see. And you'll see that it's all within the same region, all within the same park area, all nearby, all within the same scriptural Jerusalem regions. Now it also goes on to say in the book that what the ruins were supposed to be close to a fairly high sand dune in a quote large crawl or bare pan. A French explorer named Francois Balsan who crossed the Kalahari in 1948, wow, the exact same year that the fraudulent Israel was founded, told of a Hottentot or a Bushman living at Lehututu in the central Kalahari who was supposed to have knowledge of the whereabouts of a lost city. So also who else knows the truth about this too the San people they know about a lost city too it's all in their legends it's all over the place they all know about it Balsan had employed this Hottentot as a guide three years earlier on a previous expedition to Bekuana land which is present-day Botswana on this occasion Balsan thought he had trekked to within 35 miles of the lost city after Balsan's expedition failed to find this fabled lost city they claim it's a fable but again, that's how they hide the truth. The Johannesburg Star said, quote, South Africans resent this skepticism about the fairies at the bottom of their garden. Writer Haggard himself, a court official in his day, and an honest South African has shown that the drier parts of the subcontinent abound in hidden cities and lost treasure. So even writer Haggard said it to itself, because we don't know if it's actually a he, but going on, but you will never find them if you cross the desert by motor car. At least the country can do for the lost city Kalahari is to proclaim it a national monument, whereabouts at present unknown, because they always love to use, oh, it's unknown. Oh, we don't know where it is. Oh, where is it? Oh, no idea. No, they're just lying. Of course, your government officials know exactly where it is. But if we keep going, it goes on to say, ah, but that part is part of the mystery, I replied. In 1885, an American explorer did see the ruins and he took photos of them and wrote a book. And who was that? Farini, the, the book that we just read, born William Leonard Hunt, New York City. This talks more about Hunt and how what? The Bushman life in the Kalahari and how they all expedition to this area. The son Lulu also went with them in a colored South African showman. But it tells you how they, what, sailed from London to Cape Town and documented all of their journeys and how it also was addressed by the Royal Geographical Society and the Berlin Geographical Society. And then in the book that was published, it contained photographs of the lost city that we just showed you. And it was even staged a lost city exhibition that was staged in London, including photos of the city that showed the city to be of huge, massive stones stacked on top of each other and of extremely ancient construction so we see exactly what it is this reiterates the book right here how it resembles the chinese wall after an earthquake how the ruins were extensive partly buried beneath the sand at some points and fully exposed to view and one other again we've gone over that before but it's interesting how they describe it as what a megalithic city so obviously it was a huge city and very colossal right here of colossal proportions now here we are at that same book that comes from 1989 and this time we're on page 401 because if you take a look at the preview it actually chops out part of the book however I just wanted to show you these two pages before we move on but the reason we're here is because this shows you a rock painting because what the rocks the stones they cry out but it shows you rock drawing from Zimbabwe showing a reclining figure with a beard and hat that looks very Middle Eastern over here and mind you this is in Zimbabwe way but then towards the right you see clearly right here one of the strange rock paintings in the Namib desert of bearded white explorers bearded white explorers with dark skin Phoenicians and we told you that anytime you see the word Phoenician that is code word for who Yaudium Hebrews the Hebrew people in the Namib desert
Oh, but they've done a great job covering all of this up. They've done a great job going through lengths to hide all this. They've done a great job doing all this and then convincing you that their fake Jerusalem is the real one with fake prophecies such as the third temple. Not anymore. Now, before I go over the other source that I wanted to show you, this is actually a map of the journey that Farini took right here, as you can see. So now you have to kind of look sideways because uh, the map is turned the other way in the book. But as you can see right here, this is Lake Ngami over here, the Kalahari Desert. Their journey is towards back this way. Uh, Bekoana land is today known as Botswana. The Cape Colony is known as so-called South Africa. This is the Orange River over here and it's in this area where the real true Jerusalem is located on the ancient maps and up here are their roots and their journeys that they took so all within the same region where it says ruins right here that is where they found and scouted out the real Jerusalem temple and altar and place of worship. But now I'm going to take you to another source that documents and chronicles also another expedition that shows the same type of thing in the same region. Now we're here in the book that's entitled A Hitchhiker's Guide to Armageddon. This was by David Hatcher Childress and this was published in the year 2000. There's also a 2011 route, but as you see right here in the megaliths of Africa, so-called South Africa, they give Farini's route in the Kalahari Desert along with the author's route because this is another author who has actually been to these lands, been to the location, and has scouted it out with their own eyes and not with their opinions. But anyway, let's keep going. So as you, as you see right here, there's Kama's land, Bekuwana land, which is also known as Botswana, Great Namaka land which is known today as so-called Namibia and if you as you see you can see the route right here I'll link this in the description box below so that you can see it but you see the 1895 map of Farini's alleged journeys to the Kalahari the lost city is marked as ruins near the second E in desert the ruins are located near to Nassab and would seem to be located in Botswana over here and so like I say you could take a look at the map on your own time to be able to see more of this if you already have not but now we're going to explicate this book together so we're here on page 163 chapter 6 the lost city of the Kalahari and the reason we're here is because again we're getting eyewitness accounts of this region and the so-called lost city now again when it says lost city Think of Jerusalem. Think of the ancient scriptural real Jerusalem. Now, we're not going to go over all of this, but however, this video will be a little bit different because we are going to explicate this. So that means I'm actually going to be reading through this so that you can see for yourself what has been founded in this region by multiple witnesses. Because Childress in the book says, I had heard the strange tales of lost cities in the Kalahari and naturally I wanted to investigate them. Both Namibia and Botswana are still unexplored, that's what they tell you, to a large extent and all kinds of ancient mysteries are said to be there. So let's see what the journey is for Childress and see if we come up with some similarities to what Farini had seen so that we can get another witness, an eyewitness account. Now, for those of you who would like to read this on your own time, the pages that will be listed will be pages 162 all the way up until 198. Again, for time's sake, we're going to skim through a lot of this. However, I'm just going to point out certain things in this, but you can see that they took the expedition in the late 1990s, so in 1999. Now, in 1979, the author Childress had actually hitchhiked across Namibia and Botswana back in 1979, where it says on page 165, I had first heard of the lost city of the Kalahari when I had spent some time in Cape Town back in the late 1970s working in a sporting goods shop selling camping equipment. After six months of living in Cape Town, I had hitched a ride with some friends up to the coast to Namibia and then had crossed the Kalahari through Botswana to the Oka Vango swamps, which is in northern Botswana, and then on to Zimbabwe and Zambia. It was during that journey that I began collecting details about the lost city and other strange structures of the Kalahari. 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to break this down and explicate this based on subtitles uh, so that you can get a better idea of this. Now, again, this is about 30 pages long, but I need you to see all of this with both of your eyes open. And so that is the whole purpose of this. That is what we're going to do. It says here, the legend of the lost city of the Kalahari, the Bushmen and Hottentots are now called Khoi Khoi or the San people had many legends and tales of lost cities in the Kalahari. These cities were not built by them but by the ancients that's very important to know so what that's telling you and there's sources to back this up is that all of the ancient cities that are there the so-called lost cities were not built by the Bushmen or the San people there and by the way the San people are not of Negro descent so who are the ancients then let's keep going in the Sunday Times of Johannesburg back that was reported in 1931 including AJ Clement in the book the Kalahari and its lost city, A.J. Clement is another expeditioner. It is said that Mr. T.H. Howard met with the Mr. A.A. A. Anderson near the Nassab River in the Kalahari during the summer of 1873 through 1874. Anderson told Howard that he had seen ruins of a lost city up north, but that he had not approached the spot for his Khoi Khoi had warned him that the Ovambos, who are another group of people, would kill anybody who had actually entered the city. The building of the city had never been completed, and it was still possible to unearth tools uh, from the debris. And then it goes on to talk about how other newspaper articles even told similar reports. And what did they report? Well, they reported the authenticated of those stories of possible existence of mysterious ruins in the desert. The Khoi Khoi or the San, they told tales of the existence of strongly fortified walls now crumbling into the sand. Well, wasn't Jerusalem known as a fortified city, which had been seen in the Kalahari and several pieces of stone carving stated to have come the lost city were actually produced. If you go on to page 167, it tells you that certain parts of the Kalahari have found these things in these mysterious ruins even north near the Caprivi Strip in Ovambo land as in the first report. Now to get a visual of this, this right here is the Caprivi Strip, which is this strip of Namibia right here towards northern Namibia, and it's near the Ovambo area, which is in northern Namibia also, and possibly even southern Angola up there. So again, the, the main area that they were looking at is over here towards the south in this park region right here where Jerusalem is pinpointed right there but they found ruins all the way as north up here towards Namibia and getting into Zambia and Zimbabwe in northern Botswana so again that that goes to show that the real Jerusalem extended for a bigger much bigger period and much bigger location and distance According to the Kimberly Diamond Fields Advisor, which was a newspaper carried on a story back in 1949 in the summer, a year after the fraudulent Israel had been established, what perfect timing, there was an expedition into the Kalahari led by a Dr. Von Zyl in search of a lost city. Dr. Von Zyl was prompted to search for the city because of a Khoi Khoi legend about a ruined city, one of a chain of forts said to have been built between Zimbabwe and the coast by past civil Civilizations in order to safeguard the transport of gold and silver. Who does that sound like? That sounds like who? Shaluma, King Solomon. And by the way, in our uh, documentary, we've already gone over and talked about how what? Zimbabwe is what? Ophir, the land of gold, the scriptural Ophir with the cedars of Lebanon. That's not too far from it. So again, we have multiple witnesses. We have doctors going here. We have newspaper reports of all this stuff. We have documented evidence of everything. But then it goes on to say, that the ruins were supposed to be close to a fairly high sand dune in a quote large call or large bear pan and we actually read this in the other source from the book back from 1989. Now, what's also very interesting and suspicious indeed right here is in 1958, how there was a solo expedition in search of one of the lost cities and what they claim is a fabled diamond deposit. No, they just don't want you knowing about it. But then it goes on to say, it is thought that some 50 expeditions have searched for various lost cities, the last led by an elderly woman in 1986. 
I was to learn, however, that the city as generally described was much farther south near the border of Botswana and the Northern Cape Province. The only way to go was along a dirt track that went northeast to Mon and the Okavango swamps. And again, to give you a picture esque of this, you'll see right here that Mon is right there and then the Okavango swamps are up here towards Northern Botswana. We're on page 171 now that reads, the Kalahari and its people, our decision was to try to go about 300 kilometers over the border of so-called South Africa and into the Botswana section of the Kalahari Gemsbach National Park, a park that spans both countries. And then it gives a little bit more information about Botswana and the Kalahari. And again, if we look at our handy dandy map right here, once again, you will see the park right here. This is the actual park. Jimsbach National Park is also known as this Kagalagadi Transfrontier Park right here in this area. So again, just like Farini, they're in this exact same area. They're in this exact same region right here. And this also tells you too that Jimsbach National Park is referring to the part in Botswana, while the Kalahari Jimsbach National Park is referring to the part in so-called South Africa right there as you see the two of them right there. Now we're on page 172. Now I found this interesting how it says, it is believed that the first white men to cross the Kalahari were David Livingstone and W.C. Oswell in 1849. But who really inhabited that region 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago? But then it goes on to say, much of the Kalahari is still largely unknown. To them it is, with construction of a road across the Kalahari to the coast of Namibia beginning only in 1990. Three. Aerial surveys have attempted to map remoter areas. The lost cities in question would have been seen from time to time, but apparently they are quote unquote mistaken for natural rock formations. That's very important. So a lot of those rocks that have been seen and spotted in that area are not natural rock formations, meaning they have been built by ancient civilizations. And this is an actual geological and geographical and archaeological fact. Now, this book is also interesting when it talks about the Khoi Khoi or the San people, which is right here, where it says the mystery of the origin of the Khoi Khoi is still unsolved and they are not racially classified as Negroes. Let me repeat that. They are not racially classified as Negroes. Why is that so important? Because that's letting you know that what the Khoi Khoi people, the people that are in our land today, they did not construct that land. Their ancestors did not build that land, nor are they classified as Negroes. So that means who were the only ancestors that did build and construct that land back then? Well, according to the source we just read on page 401, there was what? A so-called Phoenician in the Namib Desert, aka a Yaudium, a Hebrew. So-called Negro, and it's so important that we get that through our head and understand that. But then it goes on to talk about more about the San people and who they are and where they could have migrated from towards the end of page 173 where it says the lost city of the Kalahari Jimsbach National Park. They arrived at the park just at sundown and then it talks more about it. They relax at the official Tui Riverian, a campsite renting a bungalow with two rooms, four beds, a shower, blah blah blah. Now again, what we're going to do is follow along with the maps that will also help us to be able to pinpoint exactly where they were and where these locations are on the map today. And again, comparing it with the Jerusalem location from ancient maps back from the 1800s and 1900s. But it says the next morning they were up early. So again, eyewitness accounts with actual witnesses who have been to these places. Keep in mind the Nassab River, which is the border between Botswana and so-called South Africa, that's where they are. Again, for a visual, here is where they actually are. So they're right here towards this area right here. This is the Nassab River right there that splits and divides the two countries that divides Botswana from South Africa. So what they're going to end up doing is they're going to end up traveling northward towards this region over here as we continue to see throughout the book.
Now, this is a very important point to make this paragraph here where it says inconvenient, however, was the fact that the ruins were actually on the other side of the border and there seemed to be no road on that side that corresponded with the one on the South African side. So they're trying to get past the border to get to the ruins, but there's no road to get there. Now, this is interesting where they say, although this is a national park, it is a remote one. And we saw only a few other cars or trucks all day. Did you see that? So the national park is remote. That sounds like what? No inhabitant, barren, desolate, a scriptural match. But now we're on page 175 where it says here at the campsite in Nassab where the river is that divides Botswana and South Africa so-called, we got gas and gold drinks at the store. We asked about the lost city and got curious looks. The store attendant inquired whether we were going to drive over the border. You can't go over there, she said. There's no roads over there. It's against the law. That is so important to keep in mind in all of this. Why is it against the law for them to go over that? road what are the governments hiding what do they know about that region why are they making it so that it's against the law to go to these regions what is the truth they know the truth about this land so why are they hiding it just like with the saudi arabian government hiding the real mount sinai so if we keep going, it says, at Kwong, up the river 23 kilometers from Nassab, we checked out the terrain. The famous 1948 Simon Cooper hot and top map from Dr. W. M. Borchards shows the ruins of the lost city, a.k.a. Jerusalem, a.k.a. the temple, located up a dry river that connected with the Nassab somewhere between Roy Cope and Kwong Pong. Both are north of the modern National Park campsite of Nassab, built in 1970s, which does not appear on the earlier map. So again, to get an idea of these regions, just so that you have them, if we scroll in, you see right here, there's the National Park, so it's within the park as it's known today. There's Kwang Pan, and there's Roy Kop right there along the Nassab River. And again, that we're in between Botswana and so-called South Africa, right near where Jerusalem was placed on the ancient map within the same region. And again, it's not that far from Beersheba, not that far from Bethany, not that far from Gibeon around here too and Rehoboth that's over here along with a bunch of other scriptural regions too. Now, if you keep going to page 175, it says, according to modern route maps available free from the park service, the waterhole known as Kubitje Kwap was near to the area where the dry river joined the sometimes dry Nassab. Up this unnamed dry river was said to be the ruins of a lost city of colossal size. It became clear that we were quite near the ruins, but it seemed impossible to reach. So that's where it is of colossal size. Sounds like Jerusalem to me. Not only that, but when you actually take a look at the map, the same map that we just looked at earlier, this is the map of the park. As you see, there's Botswana. There's that same Nassab River that divides Botswana from so-called South Africa. There's the Kwong. There's the Nassab River. And there's the Kubitje Kwap right here. So the ruins is somewhere along this region in this area. And again, keep in mind, please, that Jerusalem was a very vast place back then. So it was able to fulfill two or three countries. It was big. It wasn't that small one that they they show you in the fake one. Now this is interesting. Towards the bottom it says, how could we cross the dry river and head north into Botswana without risking an international incident? Now onto page 176, neither the Botswana or the South African border police would want to have to tell us that what we were doing was a serious infraction of national law. Both would require jail time for such an infraction. The South African side was especially active with scores of rangers and police driving around in their Land Rovers. Why would the South African police be so interested in this region? Why are they, what are they guarding? Why are they here? Why are they so interested in this region? region if there's supposed to be nothing there if it's supposed to be unknown according to them what are they guarding what are they hiding what are they keeping from the public that they don't want you and me to know what is it and since when did the government have the right to tell people where they can and cannot go who's in control of this world and who is trying to keep everything hidden from you well the lies and the liars and the father of all lies they're being exposed
Because here are eyewitness accounts that's saying that it was what illegal to go in these places, so called. However, what's interesting is when Farini went in this location a hundred years ago, back in 1885, well, it was not illegal to go there. So why is it illegal all of a sudden? What is your government hiding? Why, why are there police there in the first place? Could it be because the ones, the higher up ones, because they know the truth? Now, under the subtitle Farini the Great and his lost city, you'll see that it reiterates once again Farini and the explorations that were done back in the 1800s and gives a little bit more history and a little bit more background of it. And if you would like to take a look at that, you can read more of that here on your own time. We're going to go to page 177 because it talks about the photos that were taken and the ancient construction, ancient construction, the megalithic city, again, resembling the Chinese wall. Remember how we read that in the book itself from the page 350s, how the ruins were quite extensive, partly buried beneath the sand at some points, fully exposed to view and others. And by the way, it resembles the Chinese wall after an earthquake. Well, haven't there been earthquakes reported even in scriptural times of Jerusalem too? But then it says the ruins were quite extensive, buried beneath the sand at some points and fully exposed in other points. It then says that they could be traced for nearly a mile and consisted mainly of huge flat-sided stone. In some places, the cement was in perfect condition and plainly visible between the various layers of the heaps. Now you see why the rocks cry out. That is a parable that our Messiah, Yahusha, is saying. They cry out because they're crying out longing for people to know who they really truly are they're screaming but now we see the truth now but then it goes on to say some of the most uppermost stones were grotesquely worn away on the underside so that they resembled a small center table supported by a short leg now, another thing that's very interesting and suspicious indeed is that in the Royal Geographical Society report, Farini described the stones as, quote, cyclopean, heaps of masonry, each about 18 inches high, were spaces at intervals of about 40 feet inside the wall. This is telling you right here that this was, in fact, a wall. The ancient ruins that they found in this region, yes, this region right here, those ancient ruins are what? It's a wall right there. The walls of Jerusalem, the ancient walls. The heaps were shaped in the form of ovals or obtuse ellipses. They had flat bases and were hollowed out at the sides for about 12 inches from the edge. Some of them consisted of solid rock, while others were formed from one or more pieces of stone accurately fit together. Where they had been protected from the sand, the joints were perfect. Most of the heaps were more or less covered with sand, and it took his local guides almost a day to uncover the largest of them. So if it took a day to uncover some of the larger ones, imagine what's really buried under those red sand dunes. And how large were these rocks? Well, the pavement was about 20 feet wide and designed so that the longer outer stones were laid at right angles to the inner ones. A similar pavement intersected at right angles. The whole structure resembled a Maltese cross, and that's what we went over from the book showing you the picture of that also. Now, if we go on to page 178, we'll see the same thing, another witness that what Farini visualized an altar column or some kind of monument at the intersection of the two pavements. The remains of the base, which were loosely visible at the junction of the pavements, consisted of loose pieces of fluted masonry. There were no inscriptions or markings of any kind. That what? Farini concluded that the ruins were probably what? Thousands of years old. That's the first one. They must be of a city, a place of worship, or the burial ground of a great nation. That sounds, what great nation does that sound like? And again, we have the ancient 16 maps of Jerusalem to also back this up of what city this could be that it is based on maps. Again, what does the saying go? If it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. And on top of that, we even have scriptural proof to back it up because this word says that the real land would be desolate with no inhabitants. And we just read earlier in this book that this area is a remote area with little to no people in it with no inhabitants
And what amazes me is that you tell people this and people are still going to think it's a lie. People are still going to try to make excuses. People are still going to try to make rebuttal videos. People are still going to defend the lie until they're blue in the face. Well, they can do so because the truth is what makes us free. Because this place of worship, this city, this great nation that's thousands of years old, this is obviously talking about what? The altar. This is talking about the remains of the temple from 70 AD that was destroyed by the Romans. By the way, we also saw on ancient maps from 1858 Nero that the Roman conquests or Roman presence in so-called Southern Africa, just like the British, nothing new under the sun. But just so that you know that this is a documented fact, here is the map from 1858. There's Jerusalem right there. There's the Orange River that divides Namibia and so-called South Africa. There's Pella, the scriptural Pella. And there's Nero right there. Again, Roman occupation of this land. And by the way, this is called Greek Wa. Could that mean Greek too? A subliminal way of telling us of what Greek occupation because wasn't that weren't they in this area weren't the Greeks in this area in order to take over the higher call or the temple huh very interesting and suspicious indeed sounds like a scriptural match looks like a scriptural match with scripture to back it up also and then again we go over the poem again that we saw on page 359 from the book in 1886 you see the word temple right there what temple is it talking about but then if we keep going through the book, we see right here that after pouring through Farini's book, Clement, which was one of the explorers, finally concluded that Farini's lost city, a.k.a. Jerusalem, must actually lie near the small town of Mir, now called Rietfontein. And we talked about this, how Clement went with his 77-year-old dad around 1964 in that time. Now, it's interesting how some of the rock formations is known to the locals as Iredop Kopis or Eggshell Hills. And just to give you another visual, once again, here's Rietfontein, which is along the border of Namibia over here in so-called South Africa right there. And then from the area of the ruins right here in the park, this is where you see not too far away. And again, it's all within the same vicinity, all within the same Jerusalem vicinity. And again, Jerusalem was much bigger back then than what they're telling us, than what they want us to believe, because they want us to believe their condition lies not anymore. Now, another thing that's interesting, too, in Clement's research is the unmistakable outline of a large oval-shaped amphitheater, perhaps a third of a mile in length. That was the predominant feature. Then it goes over and talks about the rocks and the resemblance of the rocks. It says here, in numerous places, there were striking resemblance to a double wall built from large glistening black rocks. And it was obvious that many of the individual boulders could easily be confused with square building blocks. There were several examples of flat slabs of rock perched precariously like tabletops on underlying boulders. And one of them, more impressive than the rest, closely matched the one appearing in Farini's illustration and this is based on Clement's research so we see that what another witness to confirm that these have, were rocks that were built and were of a civilization which civilization is the question according to maps it shows what Jerusalem now, of course, through the 180s, throughout the book, of course, the researchers Clement, of course, they're going to claim that, oh, these are natural rock formations and, oh, these are not cities and whatever and etc. But if you keep going, well, the book will let you know what these really are. Because even according to Clement's own photo of one of the massive blocks with a series of four parallel horizontal grooves in it, these rocks are not natural. And even Clement admits that they could not be natural. In the photo caption, there is one that says, quote, are they natural or were they made by Farini? Just to give you an idea, here are some of the pictures that were taken of this region that you can see right here. These are the remains of ancient Jerusalem. Yes, what you are looking at are the remains of ancient Jerusalem and even potentially the temple of Jerusalem too that was ransacked by Rome as of 70 AD. Here are those rocks once again. You see them? You see how the rocks cry out and what that really means now? Because I'm telling you, the deceptions go deep. Not anymore. These 
these are those rocks right here. And this is not according to some legend. This is according to prophecy. And this is how they look. This is the parallel lines that the author had noted and was talking about in the picture. You see how massive and colossal they are? But then what's very interesting here is on page 181, and of course they're going to claim that it's tens of thousands of years old, but we know the truth now, because then it goes on to say, then I surmise that there must be other cyclopean ruins around that were also being mistaken for natural formation. So what? Cyclopean ruins, as in they were built. Civilization. But then it goes on to say, the so-called what wall? Solomon's wall is between 50 and 100 feet high imagine from three to five double decker buses piled on top of each other it is between 10 and 15 feet thick and dominates the countryside for a couple of miles on the exposed faces of solomon's wall why do you think that it's called Solomon's Wall? Why in the world is it called that because when we go to the map and this is an actual place when we actually go to it, you can actually see it right here. There's Quang Pan, which is the area of those rocks that were talked about. And there's Solomon's Wall. Why would it be called Solomon's Wall? Very interesting and suspicious indeed. Not to mention how what? This is right near Zimbabwe, right near Ophir, the land of gold. And we know according to scripture that what? Shaluma Solomon went to this area in order to get gold. Could it be that Solomon's Wall is actually an ancient border in order to divide the rest of Jerusalem from the rest of the lands and territories back then? That is, of course, just one assumption, but you could see Solomon's Wall. I mean, they're literally even telling you what these places are in these regions right in front of our faces that's right here on the border between Botswana, Zimbabwe, and so-called South Africa. On Wikipedia, the only information I could really find about it in detail, it's also known as the Thule block right here. Now, it's also known of rock paintings. And see, this is part of the deception. They claim that these rock paintings are from the San people. No, they're not. They're actually from our people. That's why what the rocks cry out from, yes, from so-called Negroes, so-called African-Americans, our land. But then it goes on to say what Solomon's wall right here. It talks about the wall that it's a basalt cliffs, 30 meters high high once formed they claim it formed a natural dam and all of this right here now it's interesting how the villagers belong to what a zionist community oh what are the zionists doing here why are they so interested in this region could that explain why they've been there since 1652 hiding maps and changing names and committing genocide and murder and rape and, and all of these different wicked things in order to hide and conceal this stuff and probably place it in the Vatican vault and other places and then give you that fake one? Here's another source that gives you the location of Solomon's Wall, as you can see right here. Why is it called that Solomon's Wall? Huh, what wall? The walls of Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, right in front of our faces, near Great Zimbabwe, the same region of gold, as you see right here. And then it also goes on to say that what some of these blocks are several feet square while others are only a matter of inches. The local Nguato tribe claimed that it was built by the quote old people like our ancestors and it is suggested that something similar to Solomon's Wall may have been seen by Farini in the Kalahari. That what it's the same thing. It's the same wall. It is huge. That is what Jerusalem. It is the same correlation. And not only that but it's just so interesting and suspicious indeed how the author then on page 182 entitles this subtitle called the curse of the lost city huh what curse does that sound like deuteronomy 28 wasn't part of the curses that the land would be an astonishment and what that's talking about is what expeditions safaris oh that is a scriptural match didn't it say that our enemies would be in our land and that they would be astonished by it? Wow, what is it talking about? Who are the only people who have been cursed according to Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26? Who is that talking about? And what is one of them? That we would not know our true land. But thankfully now Yahoo is removing the curse, removing all of that and showing us the truth and not only restoring to us who we are as a people, but also where our land truly is. Just like the Japanese, they know 
know where their land is just like the Chinese they know where their land is just like the Europeans they know where their land is well now it's our turn and even the heathen who are describing and exploring our lands are saying the exact same things because it even says because even they know who the true people of scripture are but yet the only ones who don't know are the true people well the same is true with our land too not anymore because it says here there seems to be a curse on this lost city I said throwing a piece of chicken toward the fox in the distant shadow a curse of this lost city what does that sound like what with all these dead people and being so near the border almost in some no man's land as in what nobody is there desolate curse on the lost city curse on the chosen people according to scripture according to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 even though thankfully Yahuwah is lifting up the curses so do you see what this is talking about and by the way this is based on an eyewitness this is based on someone who is actually has been there and traveled there and sojourned there and has seen it for themselves and has felt it and has been in the land not based on someone who has not been here not based on a group of people who have not been here and have never been to these places and journey to these places but as we keep going, they then go on to say that they realized that the lost city that they had found was not in the actual park, but was in another area towards the west, in the small town of Mir. And again, if we take a look at this map, we'll see it over here somewhere. If we zoom in just a little bit and go towards this way, there it is right there, Rietfontein and Mir within the same region. But if we go back to the book, it says in the small town of Mir, which is now called Rietfontein, they visited the lost city in 1965 and came back alive we looked over the maps once again and soon discovered that Riyadh Fontaine was a remote town very near the Namibian border which is right here so then what do they do the author Childress and Maritz right there they jab the finger at the lonely town and they decide to travel there themselves they decide to travel to this town that's near the Namibian border well, now on our handy dandy map we now see the route that they travel so they went from over here now they travel more westward toward Rietfontein over here as you see right here so they now have left Botswana the so-called South African region and now they're on their way to the Namibian side over here and they're going to come towards this place right here in Rietfontein very close to this town right here Arurab and by the way that word is actually a Yaudiath word because Ab means dad or father so then it goes on to say that they jumped back into the truck and drove the final 10 kilometers to the border a small set of buildings along the road out in the middle of the desert so now they're at that border between so-called South Africa and Namibia and they now have entered Namibia again they're about 50 kilometers past the border is the town of Aruab so they're near that area and that's where the eggshell hills that's where those walls are you see the walls right there aka the ruins of the walls of Jerusalem now what's also interesting and suspicious indeed is the description of the megalithic walls of Namibia because now it goes on to talk about Namibia that what vast rugged beautiful varied and virgin huh who's a virgin according to scripture isn't Yasharal Israel isn't that known as a virgin huh wow and these are not even my words these are words of someone who has actually journeyed to these places and locations and have seen it for their own two eyes witnesses wow now the Namib desert which is along the western coast of Namibia is said to be the oldest desert in the world so again ancient as we see and then of course they give the European story of it because that's the story they want us to believe that oh these are explorers no they were not exploring nothing they were just there to rape the people murder them commit genocide steal all of the artifacts bring them to their fake false locations and then give you the fake fraudulent one that's all that they were there for and they're going to keep lying about it because that's what they're supposed to do but come judgment then they'll be forced to tell the truth 
And by the way, when it comes to Namibia specifically, not one, not two, not three, but four different nations came to explore. First, it was the Portuguese, then it was the Dutch, then it was the British, and then the German. Not one, not two, not three, but four. Why are all these nations so interested in this region? Why can't they just stay in their own regions? Could it be because they know the truth? Well, let's find out because now we're on page 185 where it says with the border post receding behind us. So now they're officially in Namibia and a cloud of red dust coming out the back end of the truck. I pulled out my harmonica and blew a few bars. The lost city seemed finally within reach. Suddenly, as we came over the hill, we could see north up a wide flat valley and the valley coming close to the road was a massive pile of perfectly rectangular blocks of a massive size hey there it is and they're what giant red boulders most of them rectangular stacked on top of each other to walls over 40 feet high walls over 40 feet high what does that sound like Again, what they are describing is the ancient walls of Jerusalem. What they are describing to you is the ancient temple of Jerusalem or the Hayah Call. This is where all of that took place that you read in scripture. That is where all of that took place right here, right what they're reading to you because there's nobody there. It's desolate, just like scripture says, just like the word of our creator says, which never returns void. But then it says on page 186, they had clearly been blown clean by the wind for thousands of of years and were neatly stacked on top of each other as one would expect megalithic construction to be. Many of the blocks were perfectly cut rectangles with the corners softened by the thousands of years of exposure. Other blocks were more polygonal and rounded. Nearly all had flat surfaces. Then they say with our cameras and binoculars in hand, we climbed over the rocks and searched the entire area. It was pile after pile of huge granite blocks and it had the appearance of being part of a city a very, very worn city that was thousands, even tens of thousands of years old, even though we know that it was thousands of years old, according to scripture, two to three thousand years old. It seemed to be in, in several semicircular walls, but no obvious architecture pattern, such as an enclosed plaza, was found. Sometimes when I looked at the walls, they seemed artificial. Other times, as I studied a certain section, they seemed natural. It was confusing, and certainly they could well have seemed to be ruins of a megalithic city to any explorer but were they oh of course they were because your elite illuminati they know exactly what these rocks are they know exactly what took place here they know exactly what this city is it goes on to read sometimes when i looked at the walls they seemed artificial so we just read that part then it says i sat down on some of the blocks and took a deep gulp from my canteen the sun was hot and i wiped my forehead with my bandana was this strange place just a natural formation or was it the highly eroded remains of an ancient citadel where are we again? Well, let's find out because again, according to the ancient maps, all 16 of them which pinpoint Jerusalem in the same exact location, they don't change locations right here in south southeastern Namibia. If we zoom in, we just read according to the book that they had just left Rietfontein, which is right here, and they crossed the Namibian border. So they crossed this border into Namibia near this town right here. So they're in this area over here in eastern namibia right here that's where they are southeastern namibia so about right here where the mouse is wow that's not too far from jerusalem on the maps that's literally not that far away that's literally barely driving distance right there it's in the same vicinity right there that is not a coincidence right there so obviously Childress and Maritz, these explorers did not know that they were actually looking at the ancient Jerusalem. They must have not known that because then it goes on to talk about this rectangular stone with the series of four parallel horizontal groves on it could not be found anywhere among the blocks, yet it seemed like the same place. And again, this is based on eyewitness accounts. Are they natural or were they made by Farini? So again, the strange place, lost city, 
ancient city? Was it natural? Because they already seen and they've noted based on archaeological evidence and geological evidence that these rocks were not natural formations like your lying Zionist history books will tell you, like your whitewashed history will tell you. No, they were actually built by a what? By civilization, by the Yaudium, the Hebrew people. Just so you can get a better idea, this also shows you some pictures of the lost city of Kalahari, a.k.a. Jerusalem, in Namibia, ancient village or settlement. The nearest village is Aruab, which we just looked at on the map, towards eastern Namibia, which is which means, Ab means father, and then Aru means behold, behold, father. So as we keep going, these are some of the ancient pictures that you see, or some of the pictures of the ancient region, I should say. So you can see the stone piles close to the Arab in the South Africa. African border, possibly close to the lost city site in Botswana. You can see the site right there. There are some more pictures. I'm just going to quickly scroll through this so you can actually see the first of the two weird hills close to the Arab and the border right there. That's close to the so-called lost city. You see more hills right here. So these are just some pictures that gives you a better idea of the exact location. And then also on page 187, it says here, the desert was quiet and only the crackling of the fire could be heard. What secrets did this lonely desert keep? Huh? Lonely desert? Didn't scripture, didn't we just read in the book of Lamentations, what, that Jerusalem, how alone she sits? Now, then it goes on to say here in the cataclysm in the Kalahari that it says, according to various sources, a cataclysm occurred around 10,000 BC. Now, again, that's what they tell us. But of course, we have to use discernment. And of course, with everything we have to say, well, we already know the truth about that. That did it occur that long ago. But the truth of the matter is what really occurred in the Kalahari. But then it gets even more interesting about this. And now you see why we're reading through all of this, because I want you to see all of this with both your eyes open, which is this, the mystery of the great Karasberg Mountains. We're skipping down to page 189. We have about 10 pages left to go of this section. It says, the next morning over hot coffee, we studied our maps and determined that we should start heading back toward Cape Town, so so-called South. To our Southwest was the town of Karasberg, the largest town in the Southeastern portion of Namibia. We decided to head that way on a lonely little traveled road. Lonely once again. As the truck sped off down the dirt road, the massive blocks of stone behind us, I wondered about this desolate weird place. Desolate? Sounds like what? Wouldn't Jerusalem be turned into a desolation? Now, then it goes on to say, we were all still unsure about whether the lost city, a.k.a. Jerusalem, was natural or artificial or a combination of both. This area was a small, rocky spur of the Great Karasberg, a mountain range to the southwest of us. We headed directly west to the small crossroads town of Aruab. After filling up the fuel tank, we headed south to Karasberg. Along the way, we head through the Karas Mountains. Along here, we were to see many odd granitic formations that look similar to the lost city near the border. You see that? So where are they now? So if we get a visual of this, so now on their expedition, they now went this way. So now they were over here in Aruab in this area in Namibia. So now they went towards the south. So they obviously probably took this road right here. And they went here towards the Great Karas Mountains on their way here to Karasburg in this region over here. Now, why is this region so significant? Because the town of Karasburg right here is not that far from the scriptural Jerusalem that's located on ancient maps and even right here. You see Karasburg? Right here is Jerusalem. They're not that far away. You can zoom in and you're able to see them. Those same ruins that they found up there, those same rocks of what? A featuring a city is right here, right near the scriptural Jerusalem. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. That is not a coincidence. It is the same same exact thing. They're looking at ruins of ancient Jerusalem along with ruins of the ancient temple too.
Now getting into page 190, it'll even tell you that the area was quite beautiful and quite uninhabited. Wow, that sounds like scripture to me, quite uninhabited. And again, this is eyewitness accounts of the true Jerusalem, uninhabited, just like what scripture says. Wow. Then it goes on to say that it seemed like quite a nice area, similar to Arizona with its desert mountains. Tall mesas and occasional walls of monolithic lava walls were seen along the road. It it was a strange landscape, one of towering cliffs and sweeping vistas of an ancient desert. It even tells you that what this strange mountain range that exists in southeastern Namibia, the same place where Jerusalem is on the map, by the way, poses a number of mysteries. Oh, these are no longer mysteries. The strange rock formations and flat top mountains seem to have been inhabited once upon a time. Certainly in a better climate, they would be ideal camps for villages. Now, it's interesting how this area they noted as being what? Incredibly ancient. Then they go on to talk about flying lizards in this region too, and that there had been flying lizards that had been spotted in this region also in Keetmanshub. That's not too far from the area. And if we just quickly take a look at the map, we'll be able to find Keetmanshub right here up here. So in the same region, there have been reports of spotted flying lizards. What does that remind you of? That sounds like what? That sounds like the book of Yaramaya, Jeremiah 10.22, that what our land would be turned into what a den of dragons when you look at that word in the Yaudith Hebrew the word dragon should say what it should say monsters in some translations it says jackals but monsters now, if you keep going in the book, the books then cuts off from pages 192 through 194. Now, if you would like to read those pages, you would either have to buy it or you can look at the 2011 version and follow along that way. That will also be linked in the description box below. But basically, it goes on to talk about some of the strange rocks and the rock called the quote unquote White Lady of the Brandenburg, which is near Mount Brandenburg, or the Brandenburg Mountain in Namibia, which is Namibia's highest mountain. But moving forward with the maps, here we also see the routes that have been taken on page 195 as the book continues. So here's Botswana, so-called South Africa. And again, you can take a look at this on your own time as if you would like to, because it will be linked in the description box. But you see the Dry River, also known as the Nassab River. Here's the Kwang Pan right here. The ruins are over here in this region, aka what? The ruins of the so-called temple, the ruins of the Haya call of Jerusalem, Jerusalem ruins. There's Botswana and there's South Africa over there. And then that's the uh, Simon Cooper map redrawn. This is the author climbing up one area of the city. And this is a photo from Herman Hegg right there. You see the city walls right here. These are ancient rock formations of the wall. Page 196 then gives you another map right here, as you see. So here is the Kalahari National Park, or the Jimsbach National Park, as it was known. Over there, there's the river right there that, that divides Botswana and South Africa right here. So this is where they were at first. Then they migrated southward toward Rietfontein, then landed into Namibia right here, where they found more rock formations, and then Karasburg, where they were not too far from the real Jerusalem on the map within the same region. Now, this is something that's also interesting to note, that A.J. Clement, who had explored the region earlier in 1964, shows parallel lines on one of the blocks. Their expedition, however, that was done, was unable to locate any such rock. Had it been removed? Did your government remove it in the 1960s and 70s during apartheid like they removed other scriptural resources and other scriptural places and locations? Did they remove it? Did they hide it? Did they cover it up just like the South African police? Page 197 shows you more rocks right here. What's curious square looking wall at the city in Namibia? Which wall and which city is the question? 
And this is a picture that was taken by Childress, taken by the author on page 197, eyewitness accounts, a man-made looking wall at the city in Namibia, AKA Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. What made by man right there. This is the Jerusalem wall, just like what we saw with Solomon's wall. And then finally, on page 198, we see the route map that was taken right here of the same area at the Kalahari Jimsbach National Park, the Nassab River that goes this way, that divides Botswana and South Africa. There's Roy Cop right there. And you can take a look at this on your own time to get a better idea of the expedition that was taken on page 198 from the book. But of course, A.J. Clement and a few others will say that, oh, they're just natural rock formations. Oh, no, they're more than that. Because to test the premise, Clement explored what he regarded as Farini's true route and discovered a set of monumental rocks resembling walls. And then more recently, as of 2016, the Travel Channel aired an episode of Expedition Unknown called Kalahari Desert's Lost City, in which the host, Josh Gates, found man-made walls and rocks with artwork in an area that matched Farini's description of the lost city. So once again, more proof of walls there. So in conclusion, based on eyewitness accounts, based on archaeology, based on geology, based on scripture, based on academic resources, and based on the first-hand accounts of this region and the geographical maps, we see that Jerusalem is located in one region. And not only that, but now we also have found evidence of the real Jerusalem temple along with the real Jerusalem walls found in one location. And it's not that fake one that they give you. But then again, there are still going to be people out there that try to debunk and debate and try to do all of these things without looking into this themselves. And they're supposed to because once again, the truth will make us free. And again, the truth never needs to defend itself. And also, let me say this for those of you who do not know out there, this network, this channel is not affiliated with any other channel. It is not affiliated with any other network. It is not affiliated with any other YouTube channel. It is not affiliated with any other camp, group, or assembly that is out there except for Witness to the World, which is our outreach ministry and organization. But I have to let that be made known so that people know that. But prayerfully, this video has been very very helpful unto you and unto your studies. And like I said, this is a continuation of the Jerusalem True Locations video and will be added unto the playlist. But please continue to seek Yahua and his true son, Yahusha. Continue to test these spirits and continue to find and seek and search on your own what the real truth is, because that is what will make us free. The truth is what will make us free. This is Truth Unveiled here saying as always, Shalom.